but once again, uh, Bill is from the USNO and the WDS catalog. Thanks. Um, I should mention about uh, this other meeting that, that Yuri mentioned. I was actually one of the uh, people with Hal McAllister who put this meeting together through Georgia State University. And I thought it was a fantastic meeting myself, uh, even though I helped with it. But one of my best images of that was of the, the party at the end of it. It was a small group, uh, 100-ish people, something like that. We had a campfire and all that around there. So one of my great images is of Yuri playing the guitar and singing Beatles songs. <laughs> Which, which I understand was how he earned extra money in Russia as a student, right? Yeah, so uh, <laughs> has a great voice, too. So, uh, if you, so maybe at the, uh, at the dinner at the end, you'll have to. Uh, <laughs> money, money. Money, money. Oh, yeah, for money. Okay, there we go. So <laughs> he didn't sing that one, actually. I think it was yesterday, I believe. Um, see, I have a good memory from 20 years ago. Um, when I was asked to give a, a, a second talk last minute, uh, Brian had, give, had a talk that he'd done at the IAU very recently, so I just snagged it and uh, brought it along to, to cover the things we do. Now, I should say our speckle camera is not nearly as, as nice and sophisticated as Elliot's, uh, so we're very jealous. We, don't do, we do a BFI method of reduction brute force and ignorance. Uh, uh, so we don't have nearly the, the sophistication of either of these gentlemen here, so uh, bear with us. We try to get the job done anyway. This, so this is what we do um, between cataloging. Come on. It should. Yeah, lots of things. Ah, you, you the, the, the dongle got, got taken off. Okay. Think about it. Think about it. Oh, sorry. I think this is on. Yes. There we go. Yay. So I'm going to talk about the the speckle observing we we're doing while we're not doing the cataloging. So so this is our other our evening job. Um, we do we have two different speckle cameras. Uh, one of which is permanently attached to our 26 inch. Uh, which is it's seen on the back of it, it's an, an earlier iteration of it. Uh, this is Charles Worley, for those who don't uh, recognize him. He was the, uh, the father of the Speckle program after he had done 40,000 observations with phylomicrometry. So, uh, so one, of the, one of the giants, and a curmudgeon, as you can probably picture. Right? <laughs> so <laughs> so um, that started about 1990, 91, thereabouts. He abandoned his micrometry to go forward with Speckle. Uh, in about 2000, we, we switched the program somewhat. This is after Charles had died uh, and Brian and I were, were in charge of, of things there. So we switched it over to look for these neglected doubles, which a couple people have mentioned. Uh, and we sort of made a definition of it, not observed in some time um, or it was unconfirmed. And other people sort of adopted this definition, I guess because we have WDS, we can define things, right? And it's been a useful, I think, uh, source of, of objects for people to look at. So, so it's been a, a useful program. Uh, as you can see, I think this is a fairly recent number for how much we've done with the old telescope. So this is, this is an 1873 Clark refractor, by the way. So it's a little interesting observing program to use, uh, use the oldest piece of operational equipment in the Department of Defense for, uh, for speckle observing. Um, to show that most of the stars we look at, of course, are wide, but to show that we can actually do things that, over the course of time, actually move, which is really nice uh, on a small telescope. And there's orbit that came out using that data plus, of course, a lot more. So. Now, we, as I say, we have two speckle cameras. The one we have for the 26 inch is a very basic one. We have uh, slides to, to change objectives and, and filters. There are no uh, Risley prisms for atmospheric uh, dispersion correction. So we try to stick fairly close to uh, the zenith, and also it's a, a small telescope. We don't have quite the issues as with a big telescope. But we do uh, also do observing on large telescopes. 
If I, if I point at this rather than that, it works much better. There are a few of the different telescopes that, uh, that we use, and you can see them all listed there. And some of those probably look a little bit familiar. This is the, the cast cage at, at Kitt Peak. The old speckle camera, by the way, of Chara would, would be much here, and the person would actually have to sit in here during the nighttime and ride around because it was a film camera and you'd have to sort of do it, everything manually. So you'd uh, sit on cushions there and ride around the sky. So fortunately I got here, got there after that was done. And this talks about some of the different things that we use uh, our telescopes for. Now I should say his talk is probably a little bit long and since I didn't do it, I'll just talk until I run out of time you know, or run out of material, either one. So, so these are some of the, uh, the telescopes we use. Um, I thought you'd be interested in seeing how, especially with Mount Wilson, how we actually uh, mount the camera and use, use it. Now, the 100-inch, uh, of course, is a little bit unusual for a modern telescope because it's not a modern telescope. It's not, it does, there's no hole in the middle of the mirror, so there's, you can't do a regular cast. So it's sort of a bent cast, so you have to mount it on the side of the telescope. So you can see it strapped here and lifts up in the sky and gets attached to the, the side of the telescope here. And there's our little, our little camera on the side of this wonderful old telescope. And a different view there. Now down below here you can see uh, we set up a little table actually on the observing floor. Uh, I think that was due to some cable length issues that we decided we'd be right there, which also goes a little cold sometimes. Uh, it's fun to have this giant telescope above you that's moving around silently in, in the night. So, uh, and there I am down below. This is a picture of uh, uh, old masters uh, <laughs> relaxing here. Uh, Brian Mason, of course, to the right. And the gentleman above you, how many recognize him? You do, of course. Okay. Th this is, uh, that's Hal McAllister, who is the person who taught Brian and me everything we know, but not everything he knows, of course. Uh, he now runs the Charo Array on, on Mount Wilson. And he's the director of the observatory now. For calibration, um, we have a, a very a fundamental calibration uh, technique for, uh, for our double star work there. Instead of using known binaries, it's nice to tie some of those observations to something absolute. So we use a double slit mask. Uh, look at a bright star through a double slit mask, you're doing Young's double slit experiment, and the, the f separation of, of fringes or nice little beads that comes from an autocorrelation gives you an absolute calibration. So this is the front end of the 100 inch uh, with, with the slit mask on it. And I have some photos of, well, it in place, as you can see. It was a fun, it's a fun thing to get up there and install this. Um, the first people, well, the first telescope operator who would do that, he would actually get out on here and sort of climb around uh, on the, the top end of the, with the 100-inch with it vertical. Uh, it's a long way down to the concrete <laughs> down below, and he didn't use anything to strap himself in place. He would just sort of walk around there nonchalantly and fasten it in place. Um, there's some photos of how it's actually set up. There are little metal box frames. Let's see, is there a, yeah, there it is. Okay, little box frames that are uh, installed on the, uh, the top end of the telescope. There's some nice little uh, holes there so the pins can drop into it and it's very nicely fixed in place. And once those uh, frames are put in place, there's just uh, a canvas material that, that fills up the remainder of it with Velcro. Uh, to put it in place. So uh, Kirk Palmer, Captain Kirk, who's one of our telescope operators, and he's uh, installing it there. Now, so what do we do this opposite? What do we do with this all, all this stuff? Of course, our big job is to improve orbits, uh, existing orbits. So, so there's an old orbit. You've seen these sorts of types of uh, pictures quite a lot here. The old orbit, the new orbit. And, and obviously the various terms, which everybody knows of. We all use this, well, everybody's using the same uh, codes for in, in colors for all their uh, observations nowadays, it looks like. So the uh, shaded circles, yeah, as you can say, the four meter limit and the uh, Hipparchos resolution limit for close pairs here. Oh, 
as it says. All right. An interesting pair that we observed, I term, the, the title of the paper I think we came up with was in which we reinvestigate the remarkable case of Tweedledum and Tweedledee. We tried to give it a nice 19th century feel to it. Uh, this was a pair of stars, nearly identical, discovered by William Finson in the early 1950s. Um, when he first measured these two stars, he, they were so identical in their separation, position, angle, magnitudes, he thought his equipment was having issues and did a lot of work trying to figure out what the problem was until he realized that it actually was an identical pair. So he called them Tweedledum and Tweedledee for, for that reason. Because of the, their similarity, there were many, there was a lot of confusion as to which observation went to which pair, and of course, so it took a lot of uh, disentangling to get all this stuff straightened out. So we've observed it from the 70s. Um, eventually, so there's one set of observations. You can see they're still pretty similar there. And over the course of time, we determined orbits for both of the systems, both of the pairs. I think there's a picture here that sort of shows, shows a uh, diagram of how those two little systems, how widely separated they are. The orbit, the wide orbit is, is just a gross estimate because it's only moved a few degrees since, uh, since its discovery. It was, a, uh, it was a Struva pair originally, the wide pair. So um, they seem to be fairly coplanar, so interesting formation issues there. Come on, there we go. And the, the orbital elements of them. So. Um, some of the pairs that uh, Oleg mentioned that didn't have all of the information in the orbit catalog was because their astrometric pairs were all that was not known yet. So. Part of our job has been trying to uh, resolve some of these astrometric pairs. Um, and there's a couple examples of, you know, the astrometric orbit kind of gives you the shape of the orbit, but not the scale. So by doing some speckle observations, we were actually able to, to scale those properly. And they made pretty good sense in those cases. We do other observations in addition to our own speckle work. We try to collaborate both with our, our colleagues in, in Flagstaff others. So um, some, some of it is with the, uh, the, Navy, the Navy Precision Optical Interferometer, which you may, may have known by its previous name of the Navy Optical Interferometer for six months, and before that the Navy Prototype Optical Interferometer. Or, um, out in Flagstaff, Arizona, I think probably people are fairly familiar with it. So uh, a few hundred meter baselines, um, fairly small um, Telescopes at this point, uh, the goal is to uh, expand that significantly if we, if with the, the, uh, the Keck outrigger rigger telescopes. At this point, it's a matter of money uh, to get those installed, as many things are, of course. Um, with six-way beam combination, we can get a lot of information for some of these systems. And I believe he's given a couple examples of new systems um, down at Pretty good resolution. Uh, let's see, I believe this was the uh, res this I think is the resolution limit of the four meter, uh, and this the hundred inch. So uh, good systems, and obviously refining orbits quite nicely there. So this is and this was a combined solution with radio velocities. We uh, do some work with the Chara array as well, since both of us are are Chara. Um, devotees or whatever you'd call it. So uh, this is the Char Array on Mount Wilson, which is a, a grand old site. So the 100 inch, of course, is that what we're building there. This is the beam combining lab right along here, alongside of the, uh, the 100 inch. And see the old solar telescopes, uh, the 60 inch. So, and we have our six little telescopes there as well, six one meter telescopes. So similar uh, configuration, similar dimensions. Uh, larger telescopes, which helps obviously with the uh, magnitude difference or magnitude, limiting magnitude. Um, we've been doing various techniques, including this uh, separated fringe packet technique, which allows us to get essentially to the close speckle pairs, at the ones which don't give very good results in speckle because they're at the kind of the limit of what you could do. We can keep observing them with the, uh, with the array as well. 
I think he gave a couple examples. He was really lucky in this case because his original orbit looks pretty, pretty decent. Um, but the errors were uh, reduced considerably by, by including the fringe packet data that, that uh, tied down the orbit considerably well. Um, another orbits, uh, which we uh, have tied down masses and improved, or tied down errors, improved masses considerably using the array combination of the speckle. And a little bit of information there. Immature orbits. Well, we all know that there are orbits in that catalog that don't deserve to be there um, for many different reasons. This was a very early orbit that was done based on three data points, which is easy to, you know, it's easy to fit an orbit with three data points. It's harder when you get to that fourth data point, as you all know. Um, so a nice 72.3 year period based on that, you know, we all believe that, right? Um, Further observations tended to show something was amiss in this situation. <laughs> and it turns out that a straight line fit, despite this being an extremely close pair, this appears to be completely unrelated stars that just happen to be passing within uh, less than two tenths of an arc, arc second of each other. So, uh, so which was kind of cool. So, so we kind of believe this. So I think this looks like it's making good sense now. On the other hand, some, uh, some long period solutions look like linear systems for some time. So um, there's one that for 150 years or thereabouts looked like a nice straight line. But with more recent observations, tended to look a little bit weird. So if you blow that up a little bit, you look at the residuals. Uh, over time, as you see, dating back to 1820 or so, um, there's some interesting issues there. And we find out that it actually te seems to be an extremely high eccentricity pair that seems to be fit by this other data. Ignore that point, right? There's always one bad data point. Now, switching extremes a little bit, uh, in addition to doing uh, speckle and array work, we do photographic work as well. There was a large collection of photographic data on the double star Sirius, which had, uh, was taken in the 70s and early 80s, never reduced. Um, enough data that increases the amount of a number of observations of Sirius by about a third, it turns out. So um, Brian had a, a, uh, a high school student who uh, learned how to reduce photographic data. Um, he pulled in a retired uh, USNO person who had worked on, do on photographic work, and she learned all of the, the you know, arcane details of, of issues with photographic data. So at the same time he had one student doing NPOI reductions, he had another person doing photographic plates. So um, you see it. the orbit, last orbit was done about 50 years ago, so we we're hoping to improve the orbit. So there's the new data along there. But at one resolution later, we'll be able to uh, improve the, uh, the orbit somewhat. So Brian wants to get uh, papers by every possible double star technique, I believe. And he's, he's made, a, made a good selection so far. I think that's it.